Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the third session of the Spring 2020 Sunaki's Digital Classics um, program. Uh, this week, um, Charlotte Tupman from the University of Exeter and myself, Gabriel Badal from the Institute of Classical Studies in London, are talking about uh, markup. This is the first of two sessions on um, Epidoc, and this session is the introduction to markup. Um, for this session, uh, Charlotte will kick us off with a general introduction to the concept of markup. What do those words mean? What, what, is, what is text encoding or markup? Um, I will give an introduction to Epidoc, which is a particular kind of markup. Um, Charlotte will then give a hands-on demonstration of the Oxygen XML editor that we're recommending you use for the, um, the practical part of this session. Um, if you're using a different XML editor, you, you'll find many of the functions are the same, but the keystrokes may be different. Um, uh, we'll then give you a brief introduction to uh, two slightly more um, specific features of Epidoc, the handling of abbreviations and the handling of lacunae, in particular complex lacunae, which include both resolved and unresolved um, uh, characters. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about the exercise and what we suggest you do for, um, for that. Um, and we can then have some discussion at the end. Um, so um, if you're watching this live, um, that is to say at 4 p.m. GMT on January the 30th, um, you can also um, ask questions using the chat box, which is in the top right hand corner um, of your YouTube screen. Um, and please do please do ask us questions there and um, leave a comment or even just say hi if you like. It's nice for us to know who's who's um, who's watching and who's with us. Um, if you're watching this later, um, welcome. But um, unfortunately, you can't ask us questions live um, unless you have access to a time machine. Um, so I will hand over to uh, we're also joined this week, by the way, um, as well as by Charlotte, also by um, Dimitar Ilyev from the University of Sofia, who's another um, expert user of Epidoc uh, many years. Um, who will join us for the discussion as we um, as we go forward? So I will hand over, I think, to um, to Charlotte, who will talk um, a little bit, to, uh, as I said, about the introduction to Marco. Hello, welcome to the session. Um, I'm going to be introducing you to the the concept of markup. So let's have a look at the slides. Human beings have always done markup. We've always had reasons to mark up text, to add extra information about our texts. Um, and this is a Homeric manuscript. You can see that the editor has added um, marks to indicate places where the text might be, for instance, corrupt or interpolated or authentic. And they've also added notes. You can just about see here in the top left hand corner. Here's another example of pre-digital markup. Um, so this is a, a copy editor who's going through and, um, and marking up a text with corrections, for instance. Um, so for, for instance, in here we have no space, close the gap. So they're using, um, they're using markup to indicate that. They're using um, some kind of um, a symbol to indicate that. Um, and there's another example here. So we've got change or insert this letter. So we're exchanging the O uh, for an I here, for instance. Um, and it's really important uh, that you think of digital markup in the same kind of way. We're adding information about a text. We're saying something about uh, what a text means. Digitally speaking, um, markup is information um, that you have in a file that tells you something about the other things in that file. So your file consists of content um, and markup that tells you something about it. The key thing to remember here is that there's a difference between markup that captures how something should appear and markup that captures uh, the meaning of the thing that you're you're marking up. So the first example is HTML. Um, you can see that there are three examples here of where you might want to put text in italics. Um, the first example is a language text that appears in another language from the rest of the document. In this case, we're just saying that in the most general sense, um, and that usually appears in italics. Um, another example might be uh, a title of a book in this case, the Roman stone cutter. And another example of uh, text that you might want to italicize is 
uh, this can just belong to. So in other words, it's an emphasis. Uh, and that's something that you would expect to appear in italics. Now, the difference between a renditional markup that captures appearance um, and what we're talking about is that we're trying to capture meaning. So these examples under semantic markup show you that we are actually stating in the markup what something means. So here we're simply saying that this passage of text is foreign to the rest of the text. We're not even at this stage defining the language. We're just saying it's in a different language from the rest of the text. Uh, the second example, we have title. And the third example, we have an emphasis. So why do we do this? Well, the, the reason why you'd want to use semantic markups markup is that you're not interested at this stage in the appearance. You can choose later how you might want to display that. Uh, we're just interested in capturing meaning. It's, it's something that's designed for digital publication um, and it allows you to produce several different outputs from one file. So once you've encoded your text, you can then choose a variety of different outputs um, for, that, uh, for that text. Um, and how it's going to appear. It's really important uh, when we're thinking about this that we remember that we might want to exchange our text with other people, with other projects in future. So we want other people to be able to reuse our text in a useful way. And so marking up the meaning of something allows people to do that. Um, so we can exchange data between projects, for instance. And, and other people could then, for instance, add their own layers of markup uh, to, to the work you've already done, if you're happy for them to do so. The issue of sustainability is an important one. Uh, we might want to mark up our texts in order that we can store them uh, and archive them in a, a useful way. Essentially, the more, the more we can make our text reusable by other people, the more likely it is that they will want to preserve them in some way. Um, there's, a, there's a concept of essentially um, making our text useful actually helps towards sustainability um, in that if we design our own markup, um, which has nothing to do with anybody else's, um, and it doesn't say anything useful about the, the meaning of the text, it's unlikely that other people are going to want to take that and reuse it. Semantic markup also helps us when it comes to modeling our data and computationally uh, analyzing it. Um, if we mark up things like uh, names and places, for instance, or dates or events, things that are happening within our texts or um, perhaps materials, um, or monument types, for instance, um, we can actually then computationally analyze large bodies of, of texts and do something uh, useful with those. Semantic markup, um, certainly in the way that we're discussing here today, um, tends to be a very much a community effort. So it's developed by lots of people who are interested in the same texts and who want to find ways to publish those usefully um, in a digital uh, way. And so essentially you're engaging with a community of peers um, in, in marking up your text and in thinking about how to, how to deal with situations that you come across in your text, for instance, that, uh, that other people might not have come across uh, before. And you'll want to discuss those with your, um, your peers who are in, interested in, um, in semantic markup. And semantic markup also allows us to produce tools that can, uh, can be used to, uh, to manipulate our texts and, for instance, to convert our texts um, in various different ways that are useful to scholars of those texts. So let's have a look at some of that markup. So what is, what is a basic XML element? Um, I think a lot of you will already have seen this kind, of, this kind of markup, you might, for instance, have seen HTML. Um, we're looking at XML, um, which, as I said, is semantic markup. And it's simply formed of an opening tag and a closing tag. And you can see that the difference between them is that the closing tag has this forward slash uh, before the, the element name there. 
And everything within those tags is, is simply the content. Now, it's useful for us to have marked this up as a date, obviously, but we might want to do something uh, a little more expansive. We might actually want to add what's called an attribute and a value to break that down a little bit further so that it's computationally understandable. Because as human beings, we can read this perfectly easily. We understand this is the 2nd of March, 1827. But if we wanted to actually use uh, the, com the computer to, for instance, produce a list of all the, all the letters in this case, um, which were sent in 1827, for instance, um, then we'd need to give that date in some way that's usefully analyzable. So here we're using the ISO date, we've got a four digit year, we've got a two digit month and a two digit day. So we've got date when equals 18270302. And it's really important to notice how, how this is constructed. You have to have a space between the date and the, uh, the element name and the attribute. You need an equal sign and you need these double quotes around the value. Um, I hope that uh, that all makes sense. Sometimes you might find that you come across an empty element and that's something that has no content whatsoever. And you might think, well, what's the point of that? Um, but an empty element actually just marks the point at which something happens in the text. So in this case, you can see that the forward slash moves to the end of the element name. So whereas um, in an element with content, so you have an opening tag and a closing tag. For an empty element, it's all kind of um, put together into one. Essentially, it's contracted into one. And uh, so in this case, this is where a page begins. Um, but you can also have um, a, an empty element for where a line begins, for instance. And in fact, we'll, we'll meet one of those. Here's another example. This is a bibliographic entry. Um, this is something we can all recognize. We can all kind of break this down uh, because of the, uh, the markup, if you like, that's in there. So this is um, the punctuation that we use to, uh, to understand a bibliographic entry. Um, so we've got a, a surname and we've got a, a first name there, a forename. Um, then we've got the title of a journal article, then the title of the, the journal, followed by a volume number, a date, and the page numbers. And the reason that we can understand that as easily as we can is because of the punctuation, which is essentially acting as a markup for us to interpret that. Um, and that's absolutely vital to us because, for instance, if, if we didn't have any punctuation here, we might not know whether Berman was the first name or Merrick was the, the first name, for instance. Um, if we have a look at how we would mark that up, Here's one way we could do it. So we have a bibliographic entry, and you can see it starts up here and ends down here. And then we have the author, which we've broken down into the surname and the forename. And then we have we have various different types of titles. So we've got two different types of titles here. Uh, the first one is the title of an article. So we've given, given it a level equals A. Don't worry too much about the, the specific markup here. Just, it's just the concepts we're looking to, uh, to explain at this point. And then we've got a title level equals J for a journal title. Then both the, the volume number and the page numbers go in the, uh, the Bibble scope um, elements. Um, and you can see that we've used an attribute and a uh, value just to break that down and say a little bit more about it. So this is type equals volume, this is type equals pages. Um, and then finally, we've, uh, we've added the date here, um, as we've already seen. So this is just another way of representing uh, what we already understand here um, of a bibliographic entry. So this is, this is how we, we might um, mark that up in XML. It's really important to, oh, so the one thing um, that you'll notice, the difference between this one and this one, is that we've actually replaced the, uh, the punctuation with markup. You can see we've actually stripped out all the punctuation except obviously the punctuation that exists within the title of the article, and we haven't, um, we haven't stripped out this one either. But uh, we've replaced, for instance, that comma, um, after Berman 
uh, with the fact that this is a surname in the forename. Uh, we, we don't have the uh, parentheses around the date anymore because we don't need them. We have replaced those with a markup that are doing the same job. Of course, if we were then going to transform this at a later stage, we could decide how we wanted to represent that. And we might want to use different bibliographic formats, um, but we would be able to generate those from the XML file. Okay, just a little bit about the structure of XML. It's a very, very hierarchical thing. It's, it's actually really, really easy to understand. Um, essentially, every element is contained by its ancestor element. Um, and I quite like to think about this in terms of, of a book. Um, so a book will have several chapters within it, so perhaps an index. Then a chapter will have several sections. And then within a section, you might have a, a title and, and several paragraphs. So Everything fits very neatly into, uh, into the, the box above it, if you like. And so any element, no matter what the level, is contained by elements of, uh, at the level above. Um, and ultimately, there's one element, in this case, a book, which uh, contains all of the other elements. So they can, they can sit alongside one another and they can nest inside the, uh, the parent element there. Now, XML has some rules, and these are really important for you to know. Uh, but the good news is that there, there are very few rules. Um, the first is that all open elements have to close. So if you, if you type an opening tag for an element, you have to have a closing tag. Obviously, that doesn't quite apply to the, the, non, non, uh, uh, to, to the empty elements, rather, um, because they are contracted into one, as we've seen already. Um, then a single root element uh, has to contain the whole document. And this goes back to the diagram we, we just looked at before, where we have um, one element that contains all of the rest of them. Um, we can't overlap elements. And this is something that can easily cause errors as you're typing. So it's worth remembering this now. Here's an example where we have the role name element starting. Then we have a person name element, uh, but the role name actually closes before the person name. Okay, uh, and the problem there is that we have an overlapping element, so person name is overlapping with role name, and that's not permitted in XML. You, they have to sit alongside one another um, or nest inside each other. So the person name here, it, this is the correct version. Uh, the, where we've got a person name and a role name sitting inside that, and then the person name closes at the end. Okay. Now, because there are some characters in the, the content that also form part of XML syntax, like the, the opening angle brackets, for instance, um, if you've got one of those in your text, if you have an actual if you have an actual angle bracket in your text, you're going to have to explain to the XML editor that that isn't the start of an element. Otherwise, it's going to expect it to be, and it will cause an error when it turns out that it's not uh, it's not an element and you're not going to give it uh, the tags that it's expecting. So you have to escape them. And in this case, uh, the opening angle bracket um, becomes ampersand LT and a semicolon. So you have to use that instead of the opening angle bracket. And that's obviously, that's uh, the mathematical symbol for less than. That's what LT stands for there. And then the closing angle bracket uh, becomes ampersand greater than GT, and then the so we go along. Now, because ampersand itself forms part of XML syntax, you also have to escape that. So in this case, ampersand becomes uh, ampersand and then AMP for ampersand, and then a semicolon. Um, now, I know that that seems like a fair amount to, to remember at once when you haven't done any markup yet, but actually um, I can assure you that this will become second nature very quickly as you, uh, as you start to go through and mark up your texts. And that's it. That, those are the rules of XML. You don't actually need to remember any of the, any others, um, and, um, and they will help you to, uh, to get started with markup. I serve it to Gabby.
You're muted, Gary. Yes, thank you. Um, I just spotted that at the same time you, you said it. Um, great, thank you. That's um, that's a really useful summary of, um, of what we mean by markup. Um, uh, what we also call text encoding, um, that is the, the addition of XML um, tags to, um, to text in order to turn it into um, machine readable, semantically annotated um, text. Um, the, the very straightforward rules that Charlotte just um, showed you, and in particular the, um, uh, the final slide um, with the five the five rules of um, of uh, XML well formedness um, are so essential that if if they weren't going to be rules that you would understand immediately um, and you know you will as soon as you start doing XML you will realize that those are rules you cannot break and um, and you will have you will have you know understood them I would suggest that you actually print out that slide onto a piece of fabric and use it as your pillowcase so that you have those rules. Um, in the um, in the um, sorry, we we just received a question on uh, on YouTube, and I was distracted by it. Sorry, completely lost my thread. Um, so, um, following on from 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 Charlotte's general introduction to um, uh, markup and XML, I'm going to talk a little bit about one specific XML language, um, which essentially creates a new schema, which Adds um, adds a new um, a new language within the rules of XML. This is the the epidoc schema, um, and I'll talk about that in the context um, of first talk a little bit about its history, where where epidoc comes from, and how it fits into the digital humanities and digital classics um, uh, world, and what that means in terms of what epidoc is offering us by way of tools and um, functionality and support. Um, and then we'll look very quickly at the, um, the, the concrete examples of what Epidoc um, is and looks like and how we would use it. Um, uh, and immediately after that, Charlotte will, will give us an example by, by marking up an inscription for us in, in Oxygen so you can see exactly what's going on there. Um, so uh, let me switch to my slides just quickly. Uh, so this... Um, this is really the origin of Epidoc in many ways. Um, in the late 1990s, the, um, the International Association of Greek and Latin Epigraphy um, established a commission for epigraphy and information technology, which was called EGLE. Um, and as one of the um, conclusions of their, um, their first uh, Congress um, was that and this this was really um, a minor conclusion it was a footnote to one of their other conclusions in fact um, was that whatever format we use for this um, potential database of all greek and um, latin epigraphy that they were they were um, imagining um, it has to be capable whatever program we use has to be capable of exporting documents in what they call DTD format, by which they mean um, a format that can be validated um, because it is XML. Um, so they effectively said, whatever we do has to be compatible with XML. Um, and this, this, and this, this, this was the um, a commission of the, um, as I say, of the uh, Association Internationale Epigraphique Grecque Latine, which is the, uh, the, the, the world um, association of um, epigraphic um, uh, scholarship. Um, this this began a very long conversation, which which actually only sort of fifteen years later really can be said to have been um, implemented. Um, but um, immediately after that nineteen ninety nine um, uh, statement, um, a group of of scholars from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, published um, a, a piece of work that they had been thinking about for a while, which was something they called the Epidoc Guidelines. And they published what they called version one, actually I think they called it version 0.1 um, beta of the, of the Epidoc Guidelines. Um, and this was a set of recommendations for how to implement the, um, the standard conventions of epigraphy in XML. And what they, um, I'll, I'll come to exactly what they recommended in a moment, but those recommendations um, were picked up quite quickly 
um, and people um, people talked about them. And there was um, there was a, uh, a mailing list started up called the Markup List, hosted by the Stoa Consortium. Um, and one of the first projects to start trying to use these Epidoc guidelines to 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 produce epigraphic corpora in um, XML was the Inscriptions of Aphrodisias project, which was run by um, Professor Charlotte Rouchet at King's College London. Um, and as part of that project, a three-year project, um, uh, several workshops were run to discuss um, further development of Epidoc. Um, and this led to all sorts of um, all sorts of advances in the way Epidoc um, worked and, and um, improvements to it and additional tools and so forth, as we'll see in a moment. Um, a little bit later, um, this is sort of um, from around 2008 to 2012, um, the, uh, the project which led to the uh, papyri.info site um, also did a lot of development um, in the area of the use of Epidoc and in particular produced a large open source Epidoc publication and search interface called the Papyrological Navigator, um, and even more excitingly, um, a tool called the Papyrological Editor, which enabled people to, um, to both collaborate on editing a large corpus of papyrological texts in Epidoc, um, and also, and this was potentially more exciting if you say this to a, um, to a, a papyrologist, but possibly slightly less exciting if you say it to a, to a technologist, um, enabled them to edit Epidoc without having to look at any of those XML tags that Charlotte just showed you, just to do them typing more or less the Leiden conventions that papyrologists were used to we used to type it. That's actually a very limited tool because while it's absolutely brilliant for papyrologists wanting to edit this particular corpus, it doesn't um, uh, scale to, to most other projects and most other kinds of, um, of of Epidoc that, that are needed in other contexts. Um, so that, that particular tags free editor um, is not is not a globally used tool in the way that um, in the way that some of the other Epidoc tools are. Um, a little later, the um, uh, the eagle, you'll recognize the name, although this this um, has a slightly different um, uh, history. Um, there's a, the eagle um, project again, the um, the epigraphic archive of Greek and Latin epigraphy, as I think um, the, the acronym originally stood for, um, ran for a few years in the, uh, the mid-20-teens um, and produced a lot of tools to convert um, large existing epigraphic databases into Epidoc and vice versa um, and to produce various tools for processing those Epidoc files, for publishing them, for searching them from a single interface, for converting them into other formats, for annotating them, for linking them to um, the media wiki images, uh, Wikimedia rather, uh, Commons images of inscriptions, to Wikidata information about them, to translations, uh, to, uh, you know, public facing um, information about um, the, this, this massive uh, corpus of, which, you know, which now had hundreds of thousands, almost certainly millions of um, individual epigraphic editions um, available in Epidoc um, through through that course. So that was that was that was absolutely fabulous in terms of the amount of tooling and development of the Epidoc um, world that came out of that um, project. There are now um, almost certainly over 100, but the, the Digital Classics Wiki knows of 87 projects that use Epidoc. Um, I'm sure there are many more than this. We should we should we should do a survey at some point and improve this list. But um, you can see you can see here some of them um, and looking looking at this I think it's, it'd be quite a good way of, of looking at some of these projects and seeing how they use Epidoc and what they do with them and some of these projects make their Epidoc files available for download, some of them make their tooling available for, for reuse um, and so forth. Um, so so what, how, how does Epidoc work? Going back to, to the start, um, the, the, the first thing, the thing that actually made Epidoc something that was going to work um, that came out of this 2000 publication by um, Elliot and Kalis and Hawkins was um, that Epidoc, Epidoc recommended the use of the TEI XML. So they didn't try to invent a new XML schema, they used TEI, the Text Encoding Initiative XML schema, which had been used for literary linguistic historical corpora um, since um, the late 1980s. And what they basically did was, rather than trying to reinvent the way epigraphy is done, they used existing epigraphic uh, conventions, the Leiden distinctions and the database fields used in large epigraphic databases such as Eagle, Petraeae, and others, 
And they simply provided, the EPIDOC guidelines were basically a concordance from Leiden and epigraph, epigraphic database fields to TIXML elements. Um, this then made it very easy to use, but also easy to draw on TEI, um, uh, existing TEI tools for working um, with these and for producing publications and searching them and so forth. Um, Epidoc very quickly um, began to be used for other disciplines as well as simply epigraphy, very, very closely related disciplines. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend using um, Epidoc, you know, to to encode 19th century letters necessarily because that's a little bit too far away from the core constituency. Um, but it was very quickly used for papyri um, and other ancient text bearing objects, including seals and coins, and those in languages other than Greek and Latin, including cuneiform, Arabic, Hebrew, Mayan, Sanskrit, and many other ancient languages that um, that are in there. And actually, if if you're interested in ancient letters as physical objects, then actually this would work just as well on 19th century letters, um, despite what I just said. Um, so TEI was useful because it, um, it specifically um, existed and was, it pre-existed and it had a large um, community of use and a lot of tools that, um, that already existed and were available um, for use with it. Um, it was very well documented. They had, they, 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 there's a very good um, set of, of TEI guidelines um, online that can be um, seen at this link on here. Um, and Epidoc, um, rather than uh, customizing TEI in the sense of taking the bits that are useful and adding the bits that are missing, um, Epidoc is a clean subset of TEI. That is to say, if there's something that is not possible to be do in, in TEI, then it's also not possible to do it in Epidoc. There are lots of things that it is possible to do in, in TEI that we've left out of Epidoc because they're not um, key to, to, the, to, to the encoding of ancient um, inscriptions of papyri. Um, but it, it, you know, if, if there's something we want to be able to encode in our, in our epigraphic or papyrological editions and you can't do them in TEI, then we're shit out of luck. Um, although we're not, because the TEI is not a static body of um, of, of guidance and and uh, and practice. Um, it's a very dynamic group that has a technical council that is constantly, actively adding to and improving the TEI. And the chair of the TEI council, this is our secret weapon, is one of those first three initial inventors of Epidoc. Um, and still a very active uh, member of the Epidoc community. So actually, if Epidoc needs something that TEI can't do, we've got a pretty good chance of getting the TEI to adopt it. And within a year or two, it will be available, and therefore it will be available in Epidoc as well. Um, and we can benefit from all the other things that the TEI uh, benefits from in the, same, in the same way, all the various tools that exist and so forth. Um, and this is exactly how, um, how everybody uses the TEI. Anyone who uses TEI, they don't just turn up and expect something ready-made because TEI is, is a monster um, of a schema. It has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of elements available. And you know, any particular thing you might want to do, there's six different ways of doing it. Um, and you know, you'll want to customize that, um, narrow that down to, um, to, to the way you want to do it in your project, or in the case of Epidoc, in the hundred or so projects that you that you expect to be catering for with this um, with this schema. So um, this uh, subset of the TI that Epidoc produces is exactly how the TI was designed to be uh, used. Um, so what does Epidoc give you? Epidoc gives you. Um, primarily um, access to a, um, a community of people who work with inscriptions and papyri and coins and uh, stamps and seals and similar types of objects with text on from the ancient world um, in TIXML. Um, this community also um, provides a lot of the development in terms of software development um, and so forth. And the, uh, the core of the Epidoc um, resource, if you like, is the Epidoc guidelines. There is also the Epidoc schema, which is a schema that gives you a bunch of rules. Uh, you remember the five rules that, uh, that Charlotte told you um, you have to um, follow in order for your XML to be well-formed XML. Um, you, um, you have to, um, in order for your XML to be good Epidoc, it also has to follow a few hundred more rules. And that's a much longer list that we wouldn't want to have to try and um, you know, print onto your pillow and have you memorize um, by five o'clock the next day. Um, so uh, instead we have something called a schema, which um, 
put, it embeds those rules in your XML editor for you. So if you type your XML, it'll say what you can put here is the following things. And you know, when you type something that's not allowed, it'll say, no, that's not Epidoc. You can't put that there. Um, there are also a bunch of um, transformation and publication tools that have been made available by various projects that, um, that have uh, worked with Epidoc. And you've, you've seen, um, we've talked about some of those projects already. And um, the main things that are usefully have come out of that are the Epidoc reference style sheets, which is a bunch of style sheets written in a language called XSLT for transforming Epidoc XML files into HTML pages that can be um, can then be read, you know, displayed in a web browser, uh, posted online, and so forth. And um, there's also um, a newer tool, which is a tool called Epidoc Frontend Services, or FS, um, which is an Epidoc publication uh, platform, which will, in addition to using the Epidoc reference style sheets to transform individual Epidoc, Ep Epidoc files into web pages, will also index them, make them available in a search interface, and all sorts of other things, um, for uh, which are you know, very useful. Um, I won't say any more about that now, because that'll be the subject of our next session in two weeks' time. Um, uh, where you will you will learn how to use FS, and we will you know you you will load up the Epidoc files you've created in there and see what happens. So what does this mean concretely? Well, firstly, I'll go back to um uh, to um some of some some of what Charlotte said, where she was talking about what is a markup language, um, and just as the uh, the proofreaders um, or copy editors. Um, uh, marks that she showed are a markup language where you put this little underlining and it means do this to do this to the text. Um, epigraphers and papyrologists have for almost 100 years um, had a standard language for how to encode um, the physical and, um, and uh, editorial nature and state of an ancient text. And these are called the Leiden Conventions after, um, after a meeting held in Leiden in 1931. Um, and this is this is what the Leiden Conventions um, uh, give you. Basically, this is a simplification, and there are a few more things in there, and there are a couple of variants. Um, so the very first one I've got on here, where we have a, you know a number of dots, which represents a number of illegible letters. Um, Charlotte, who is a Latin epigraphist, will probably tell you that that shouldn't be dots at all, and I must have made a mistake, that they should be little plus signs rather than dots. But being a Greek epigraphist um, and occasional part-time papyrologist, um, I use dots rather than plus signs. So there, there are variants in Latin, right? There, there, are, there are people who use things that are slightly different. Um, but the rest of this, I think we would both agree um, on everything on the rest of this slide. When the dots appear under a letter, that means the letters are ambiguous, but I've got a sense I can guess what they are, um, partly because of their, what remains of them and partly um, because of their context. Things in square brackets, um, the letters are missing, and with dots inside, that means they're missing, and we don't know what they were. When there are letters inside, they're missing, but we do know what they were, and we can restore them. Um, letters in angle brackets were not missing because the, the service has been damaged, but are missing because the scribe somehow forgot to write them or erroneously didn't write them. Something, something happened at a, at a slightly different stage. The error was in the scribe's head, not on the page. Um, parentheses represent abbreviations. So this is, this is similar in a way. There's something which the scribe never wrote, but it's not because they made a mistake. It's just because they didn't need to write it in order for you to understand what was there. They just left part of, part of it out. So they wrote IMP because everyone knows that imp means imperator. So they didn't need to write out the, the, the word imperator in full. And we consider that an abbreviation. And we can, we can spell it out um, in full. And then there are conventions for letters that um, we think the scribe wrote um, on the surface in error, and we should we should ignore, and for characters that um, were written on the stone and were then later deleted by um, either the same scribe or another scribe, and those we put in double square brackets as, as you see there. So this is this is the um, the Leiden conventions. Um, Epidoc basically says take those same those same um, concepts that the Leiden conventions represent, and instead represent them using TIXML. And here, uh, this slide just gives you a, a summary, simplified summary of how we would represent those um, eight or so concepts um, that I've just described in TIXML. So I won't linger on this for very long, but you might want when you're um, going back over this in order to, um, to, to practice for yourself, you might want to pause on this slide um, and get, get a sense of, um, of what's what's going on with all of those. Um, note that those that have uh, dots 
in the, um, in the convention rather than characters have no content in the elements, but rather how empty elements, as Charlotte showed you, with a forward slash at the end of the opening tag. Ones that have text in the, um, in the convention will also have text inside an XML element in the, um, in the TEI there. Um, a slightly more um, rich but still um, simplified and, and summarized version of, um, of the Epidoc um, conventions can be found in this document. This is only the first page of a two-page document, um, in, um, as, which is a, a, a coda, if you like, to the Epidoc guidelines, um, which is what we call the, the Epidoc quick reference. Um, and this basically gives you, and the bits that you're interested in are the description in, in this column here, um, the, the Leiden um, in this column here, and the epidoc in the final column. Most of the other things you can, um, you can ignore for, in terms of reference. Um, so this, this is what you will have, and you can, you can download this file from um, the URL at the bottom of this, um, at the bottom of this slide, and when the slides are uploaded in PDF shortly after the end of this session, um, you'll be able to just click on that link rather than have to type the whole thing. Um, and this this is a Word document with these slides, and so I would suggest you you print these out and have them to hand as a quick reference document as they're supposed to be. Um, if you want the full version of the Epidoc guidelines, you'll see at the top of this page it says, and at the bottom of this slide, um, it has a link to where you can find the Epidoc guidelines, and that's where you go to get. Um, the uh, more information about how to do something if, if it's a little bit more complicated than this, um, than this very simplified uh, version um, on, on, this, on this slide. So that, I think, is my um, brief introduction to Epidoc. This is, um, that uh, was what we normally cover in about the first four hours of, of a week-long Epidoc workshop. So um, apologies if it felt a bit um, rushed. Um, I um, I guess over next to back to Charlotte. Charlotte's going to sh talk to you about the uh, the oxygen um, XML editor. Bearing in mind that um, not everybody watching this might be using the oxygen XML editor. If they already have an XML editor that they prefer, um, they might they might use something else. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. And um, sorry to interrupt. I, I haven't forgotten uh, Mohammed's question on um, on YouTube, but we'll come back to that later since it's not specifically about it. Okay. Great. Okay, let's have a look at the XML editor uh, that we're going to use. Um, it's called Oxygen, as Gabby said. There are there are several options for an XML editor. You don't have to use this one, but um, this is the one that we've uh, found to be the most uh, the most useful one. Of what we want to do. Uh, so what is an XML editor? Well, it's an application that, that was designed to work with XML files. It, it can also work with all sorts of other uh, files, but uh, we're going to use it today to look at, uh, at XML files and to edit, edit those. Um, and one of the things that it does is it checks, to to, it checks whether or not uh, the file that you're writing is actually um, conforming to those rules of XML that we looked at um, on, on, on the slide earlier. So it basically checks as you type, uh, which is really useful um, because obviously sometimes you might want a bit of help um, if you can't remember all the rules uh, or if you've made a mistake, you want it to, uh, to tell you what you've done wrong. So it checks or not, whether or not you're following the rules of XML, but it also checks whether or not what you're writing is valid according to the schema. So Gabby mentioned the Epidoc schema, uh, which gives you a list essentially of elements and attributes and values that can appear at any point in a file or that must appear at, a, at that point in the file. And, and essentially what that does is it establishes consistency um, across the file and across a project. So it does both those things. It checks whether or not it's well formed and it checks whether it's valid. And one of the other things it can do is to give you a sense of the overall structure of your file. So if you're working on a really, really long text, for instance, that might be really helpful. If you've got hundreds or thousands of lines in your text, you might want to see um, what that overall structure does. And it does many more things besides but those are probably the most useful ones uh, for us today. As I say, we're going to have a look at something called Oxygen XML Editor, um, and there's a link there for you to, uh, to download it. Um, there are various uh, programs produced by Oxygen. You just need the editor. You don't need to download author and developer as well. Um, just go for the editor. Um, and you can get a 30-day 
30 day trial license uh, with that. Um, there are uh, other XML editors um, available and it's completely fine to use one of those. Um, we're only going to demonstrate one today, but feel free to use uh, whichever editor uh, you find most comfortable. Okay, um, I'd like you to, to download this template XML file. Uh, there's the link. Uh, that's the, the file that we're going to, to look at today. Um, and that just that just means that we're not having to write our, our Epidoc file from scratch. It means that you've got uh, you've got something that's already pre-populated with a certain amount of markup, um, so that we can just slot a text in and and have a look at marking it up. Okay. Um, we're going to be using. Um, this example inscription, um, so this is a tombstone from, from Lisbon in Portugal, um, and it's actually, it's the end of a monument. You can see that in the museum, um, they've, they've reconstructed the base. This is essentially the lid of a two-part funerary monument, and this actually stretches back. It's a kind of semi-cylindrical monument, and we're looking at the end of it. And so um, this was, this was uh, the lid of, of, of the tomb monument, essentially, and uh, at one point there would have been a... Um, a sort of a metal clasp hammered in here to keep the two parts together. And so um, I've given you here a, uh, a transcription of, of what's on the stone. Um, some of it's quite hard to read, so you might have to trust me on some of those lines. Um, then we've got the editor's uh, version, which is a sort of version where the editor has expanded the abbreviations and, um, and has, uh, has added some text uh, where there are letters missing from, from damage. You can see, for instance, uh, there's some damage here uh, to the monuments. Um, and there's, there's one letter um, that's, that's perhaps a little bit unclear. Um, and, and so these things are represented in the, the editor's version. And here we've got a translation for you as well. OK. Let's have let's just switch over to to oxygen and and have a little look. Hopefully you've downloaded that example file by now. Um, so I'm actually just going to. So when you open the program, it might take uh, a minute to open the first time. Um, you'll see something that looks like this, and I'd like you to go to file and open. And I'd like you to open that template file uh, that uh, that you downloaded. So it should look something something like this. So you'll have a screen that has the template file in the center. And then on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you'll probably have various, um, various menus. Um, if you like, just to make things easier, um, you can close those. You don't actually need them uh, for now, um, and you might want to to, uh, to fill most of your screen with uh, with what we're doing. Um, you might find that the text is quite small, so I'd recommend going to options and then preferences, and then it'll take a couple of seconds. Yep, and then it'll bring up a menu. And if you just if you just start typing font. Uh, it should come up with a, a font option. And then if you if you have a look in this appearance fonts menu, there's a there's an editor box, and you can see that if you choose, it will give you the option to select the font that you want, uh, but also the size of the font that you want. So for instance, if you want to increase it to 24, if I say OK and then apply, it will make the text bigger. No. Uh, quick, quick note if I may interrupt. No, one reason, one reason you might want to select a different font is mm -hmm. that the default font may be a fixed width font, which if you're typing in Greek or some other yeah. non-Latin script, um, it may not get complex characters with polytonic um, diacritics on them. So if you select from that list a font that you know has all the, the, the Unicode coverage you need for your language. Absolutely. Thanks very much for that, Gabby. And, and actually, um, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, here I'm using Arial Unicode MS, which I find is, um, is fine for my particular purposes. So if you have a look at this, uh, this file, um, we're not going to look at all of the elements because um, uh, that's not, uh, not the plan for today. Um, but I just want to show you a couple of things. So at the top, um, we're just saying, here's the schema 
that so uh, here's the epidoc schema uh, that, that we're looking at so it's pointing to the address of that schema and then essentially the, the files divided into two main parts there's uh, there's a tei header um and then there's the um uh the other bit that we're interested in looking at today um, is the text. We also have uh, the facsimile element here in case we want to, to include a URL for a photograph of the monument. Um, and you can see that this, this follows the rules of XML. It's nicely sort of spaced out in the editor so that, um, so that it's indented to show that, um, that hierarchical structure that we looked at of XML. So we have one element, uh, the TEI element, which starts at the top and it finishes right down at the bottom. So that's the one element in which all of the other ones are, are nested. And there's a little um, arrow to the left-hand side, which is useful if you want to just fold up some of the lines. So it, we're, we're, we're noting here that it's in the TEI header that we put information about the, uh, the, the object that we're looking at. So we might want to put the title of the document, something about where it's uh, where it's held, perhaps an inventory number. We might want to describe the object in some way, talk about the material, the type of object, and so on. Description of letters, all of that kind of information goes in the TEI header. Um, but if we're mainly interested in looking at the text as we are today, then we can actually just close this up, um, and you'll see it says TEI header, forty three lines. But that just gets us out of our way while we're um, while we're working on the text. And I'm going to do the same thing for the, the facsimile in this case as well. Okay, uh, so the epidoc, uh, the epidoc uh, text is is going to we're going to put it in into the uh, div type equals edition. So we've got we've got several different divisions uh, in epidoc. We have a div type equals edition, div type equals apparatus, div type equals translation, and so forth. So we've got one for commentary, one for bibliography. Um, and the one we're interested in right now is, as I say, div type equals edition. Um, now, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the structure. The first thing we want to do is think about how our text is structured. And we're using quite a simple example here. Uh, today, we're going to use something that just has a few lines. Um, but just to make you aware that um, AB uh, just stands for anonymous block, and this is just any kind of block of text uh, that we're not defining further. It's quite a useful um, element, in case you're wondering what that is. OK, I think we'll go for the option of just pasting in uh, our text, and then we'll see how to uh, to mark it up. Now, I think I'll need to paste it in from here. So let's have a look. So I'm going to take the, uh, the editor's version. So I'm going to copy that, and you can follow along if you like. OK, well, I'm just going to paste that in here. OK, so, so all that's done um, is it's just it's pasted it in. It doesn't look very neat right now, but that's OK. Um, it's pasted it in line by line. And if you go to your cheat sheet, um, if you've downloaded that, you'll see that right at the very top of the cheat sheet um, is, is what you need to do for line breaks. That's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to define the line breaks. And uh, very helpfully, the example file has already done that for the first line. Um, so we need to mark up the, the second line. And there are a few different ways that we can do that. Now, this is uh, an empty element. So we just want, want to mark the point at which the line begins. And if we press Control E, if you're on a Windows machine, or Command E, if you're on a Mac, um, what that will do is it will bring up this list of elements. OK, so we have a number of elements to choose from. We know that we want an LB. So I'm going to start typing LB. And um, interesting. There we go. Um, we we can then um, so we either just press return or OK, um, and then we want to give it an attribute. Okay, so we've got our element, and then to to add an attribute, we just hover 
um, the cursor at the end of the element name, so at the end of the B, and then press a space. And that will give us some options uh, for what attribute we want to add. And you can see for each case, if you hover over it, it will tell you a little bit more about it. So this is drawn from the TEI guidelines that Gabby mentioned earlier. We know we want an M, and so LBN equals two. Now, at this point, what I would do is I would just copy and change the number because that's a lot quicker than doing anything else. But I just wanted to make you aware of, uh, of a couple of different ways of doing things. So we'll look at how to um, to add elements with content in a moment. So we're just going to change our line numbers here. OK, so we've got all our lines. Now, this button up here, Format and Indent, is quite a useful one. If you press that, oh, OK, so it's not done that. That's OK. Uh, sometimes that's useful for tidying it up, but I'm just going to use the Tab button for now. It'll just make it easier for us to see the structure. OK. Right, so we've got our structure. Um, then there are a few things that we're going to want to encode. So we want to replace the uh, the markup that's already here. In other words, these um, these brackets from the Leiden conventions that signal something about the text. In this case, that this is an abbreviation. Um, so let's have a look at abbreviations briefly. Um, if we go to on the on to the second page of the cheat sheet, um, and we're looking at ten point one expansion of an abbreviation. So we want to put, uh, this time, we want to put an element around that whole uh, that whole word. And to do that, we use our control E, but we've actually highlighted it first. So we're going to wrap this in an element. So control E, and as it happens, um, abbreviation is the first thing that comes up. But if we have a look on our cheat sheet at 10.1, we can see that the first thing we need to add is actually an expand tag. So I'm going to start typing expand. OK, and you can see that it's it's wrapped, it's wrapped the chi in an expand tag. Now, you can see that it's not happy. It's got a red underline and you can see that the box up here on the right hand side at the top has turned red. So what that means is that it's it's no longer uh, no longer valid according to the schema. It says expand should contain X. In other words, there are elements that have to appear inside the expand. And there are two things that have to appear if we look at our uh, our 10.1. One is the ABBA tag, that's A-B-B-R. That signals the part that's abbreviated, OK? And then here, we're going to add an X tag according to the cheat sheet. And, and that signals the, uh, the part of the text that is being expanded, OK? So the whole thing is wrapped in the expand, then we have an abbreviation and an X. Um, and you can see it's now gone green uh, on the, on the, uh, the right-hand side at the top. Um, that, therefore, we know that uh, the file is valid. If for any reason it's being slow, you can use this button here, which is the validate button. And if you press that, it will, um, it will check whether or not the file is valid. Now, the one thing I haven't done here is I haven't removed the brackets, which I can now do because I have replaced those brackets with the markup. OK. Now, I'm not going to do this for everyone because this is just a demonstration. But obviously, we would do exactly the same thing here for all of the other um, all of the other abbreviations. So we'd have expand, ABBA and X. Here we've got a letter that's unclear. So again, if we uh, if we notice, it's got a little under dot underneath it. Um, and we need to have a have a look on our cheat sheet. We can see under 3.3 letters ambiguous outside of their context, uh, context. and we just need quite a, sim a simple element there. It's just the unclear element. Okay, so I'm going to wrap that letter using my Control E, unclear. There we go, and then I can get rid of all that. Mm -hmm. There we go. I used the backspace there to get rid of the, of the underdot. OK, so that's how you deal with abbreviations and unclear letters. The, the other thing we need to look at is uh, there are two more things I want to look at with you. Uh, one is here we have uh, Tusca. That actually goes over a line. So you can see there's a hyphen there to indicate that this, this goes over a line. 
Um, and in this case, what we do is we add an extra attribute to the uh, line, line break number four. Um, so that's space, and then down to break, and we say no. So this line beginning should not be taken as a word break. Okay, so it says clearly word would be hyphenated in the printed text. So we're saying there isn't a line break um, here um, in, in uh, because this is actually one word. So sorry, clearly it is a line break, but it's not breaking. Um, uh, it, it, it's in the middle of a word. It's not an actual break. Okay, so again we can remove the hyphen because we've we've done the same thing uh, with the markup. Uh, the other thing I want to look at is where we have square brackets. So this is where we're supplying this letter A, because we as an editor know that that's an A, um, but it's actually missing on the stone. And you'll find that under, let's have a look, what is the, yeah, so it's 8.1, characters lost but restored. So you can see there that we need a supplied element. Okay. Let's wrap that in a supplied element. And it's telling us element supplied missing required attribute reason. So let's start typing reason. There we go. And we can press return. And it's given us some options, a constrained list of values. And we're going to say reason equals lost. OK. And again, we can take away those square brackets. There is actually one more thing we can do, which is we can point out that these um, these full stops here are actually interpunct on the text. If you go back and have a look at the picture, you'll see that they're little triangular interpunct. And what we can do there is, if you go to the very bottom of the cheat sheet, sheet um, it says symbol. Um, and we could, if we wanted to, uh, replace that with a G, stands for a glyph, which is actually an empty element. So if we press the... Um, forward slash, it, it contracts it for us. And then we're going to say g type equals, and here it doesn't have a constrained list of values. It allows us to put what we like. So we're going to say interpunct. Now, you might want to go through and, and do this for yourself. I'd certainly recommend that. And I think it would be a good idea to, um, to, to work your way through and, uh, and actually mark up uh, the rest of the text. I've just done one example of each one for the sake of time, but you can uh, you can obviously work through that in more detail. Okay. Great, thank you, Shana. Um, so, um, a question now. Um, we have taken slightly longer to give this introduction so far than we had scheduled for in time. Um, which is inevitable. That's how every single Snug session goes, so that's not a problem. Um, but a question for um, both Charlotte and Dimitar, should we um, go ahead with the two slideshows that we, that we, the two sets of slides that we still have planned for the rest of this session, or do we think we can abbreviate that slightly? Um, we need to make a quick instant decision. I think uh, we can certainly cover the uh the lacunae very quickly. Okay, so and um, I mean the abbreviations one, perhaps, um, uh, perhaps if you're happy to, to cover cover that briefly. Um, okay, yeah. So let, let's go ahead with them, but do them more quickly than we would otherwise. That's fine. Tell, you you agree? I I want to I want to intervene just to uh, to make a point about uh, spaces. Uh, the way spaces are treated in uh, Epidoc XML, uh, that uh, people should be careful in the encoding. This should be, uh, <clears throat> this should, this should be uh, emphasized that uh, they make a space between the element name and the attribute name, but uh, within the content or between the different elements, uh, the lack of space versus presence of space is what uh, uh, counts and it doesn't uh, doesn't count how much spaces you put in between or uh, new lines or indentation. This is uh, something that probably should be uh, stressed as people try to uh, get around on the exercise. And uh, yeah, they will, like they will get mistakes if they don't. Yeah. Would you yeah, like to demonstrate that in oxygen? Would it be helpful? Yeah, why don't you yeah. do that just quickly? Yeah, this 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 does connect to um, to your um, your uh, question about why 
um, the pretty print button didn't indent your lines for you, um, which is that the the div type equals addition has XML space equals preserve as an attribute on it precisely to stop editors from pretty printing those lines and inserting spaces where we don't want them. Because if you had um, if you had an element that you didn't want space between for reasons that Charlotte's about to explain, um, and you pretty printed it and it spread, spread those out and indented them, that would introduce space, which which could potentially be mid-word or, or something. Do you want to switch back to my screen in that case and we'll just talk that through? Sure, yep, yep. Okay, so what we're talking about here is that um, if the object includes uh, spaces in a very particular way, um, so for instance, if, uh, if I didn't have a space here, then even though there are tags in between the Yulia and the C, actually, um, that would output with the C right next to the A. Okay, so we have to make sure that there is, there is a space here. But if we, um, if we accidentally put a, a space in here, for instance, then uh, we would have a space appearing uh, between the C and the rest of the word, which we wouldn't want. So you have to be really careful with that. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning is that um, oxygen treats one space and several spaces in the same way, though. So if you have, if you had, uh, say, some more spaces here, it would still treat that as one space. Okay, so it's really that's quite a useful one to know. Um, it's that's also, XML, not just oxygen, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry, yes, absolutely. Um, and if you if you use a, a, a return as well, um, it, it, that treats it as one space too. Okay, so um, so if you were to to press a return here, um, and that moved on to the next line, um, that would still be treated as uh, as one space. So in your in your um, in your addition, you would still need if this if this were in fact a new line, you'd need to mark it as a new line. Okay, otherwise it will just appear as one space. Um, what else do we? Is there anything else that we need to explain there? No, I think I think that back does it, doesn't it? What, what what we're basically saying is that if you would have a space here in your print edition, in your text only edition, then you can enter a space there in the XML or as many spaces as you like or new lines, um, such as the multiple spaces at the beginning of the line that you use to indent um, this these tags. Um, those can appear anywhere where where there would be space in your um, in your text. You can also have as many spaces as you like after the element name and before the first, before the attributes, for example, um, in G type as you have down there. Um, uh, those, those are fine. But anywhere within a word that you wouldn't have spaces in plain text, then you don't want to have a new line there in the in the XML either, because a new line counts as space. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that suggestion, um, Mitko. That was a that's an important that's an important part of uh, part of XML rules. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, just quickly, then we've got um, we've got two short presentations that um, that Charles and I have proposed to um, to to show at the end of this um, session. Um, but we just wanted to show um, just quickly that there's a link here to a page called Epidoc Summer School, um, which um, which actually is a summary of, of many, many, many different Epidoc training events um, that, have, that have happened or will happen. And um, on that page, there, is a, there are links to dozens of different slideshows, uh, many of which may be of interest to you. Um, they're not full training sessions because they don't have you know any speech going with them. They're just the slides, um, but they may still be useful. Um, and they're all Creative Commons licensed, so you can reuse them if you need to. Uh, and the slides that we're about to show here are taken from that um, from that list as well. So um, if you want to um, uh, to follow that, um, you um, you can find them there as well. Um, so just um, quickly then, I'll talk um, very briefly about abbreviations. Charlotte's already given you a, a sense of how abbreviations work. Um, and um, 
I'll, I'll, I just want to deconstruct that a little bit because it's, it seems you've probably looked at it and thought, why, when you're in Leiden, all you have is one set of parentheses. Why do you need three different XML tags um, or three different pairs of XML tags around that? You've got, you know, you end up with a span of text, which is probably nine times as long just in character count than, than it would be in the Leiden. Um, this is this is really cumbersome, and this just to sort of to unpack that and explain why. Um, so this is the simplest kind of abbreviation. This is similar to the C for 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 Kai that um, the Chella should, where you have on the stone you have the letters A U G, which in the addition we expand to Augustus. Um, and so what this means is there are three different things that we might want to be able to pull out of that text um, for processing in different ways. There is what is on the stone, that is the letters A U G. What is the full word that we want to be able to read um, or parse or lemmatize or do other things to linguistically or index? Um, and that is the word Augustus. And which is the part of that word that we want to put in parentheses in the print edition to, to keep the epigraphists happy so that they forget that there's XML here and they, they just think it's um, what they're used to seeing. And that is the letters Ustus at the end of that word. Okay, so those three parts. Um, each have to be indicated separately. And we indicate those three parts without any repetition of characters by nesting them as, as given here. So we have an expand, which is the full word Augustus. We have the aber, which is just the part that's on the stone, and the X, which is just the part that has the parentheses around it, just the part that is being expanded by the editor. So you see um, how the, the nesting of those elements um, creates that um, that quite the, the ability to pull out um, whichever parts of that you want and an xslt transformation um we um the text runs through um, the, the, the script runs through the XML that it finds um, and it, it performs certain um, functions depending on what element it comes across. So when it comes across an expand element, um, the basic transformation basically says expand. OK, great. Do whatever you want to do with what's inside it. Continue to follow the rules, but don't do anything special. Um, when it comes across the ABBER element, it says, great, print the content of ABBER and then keep going. And when it comes across an X element, it says, great, um, print the content of that X element with parentheses around it. And so it gives you um, something like, um, slides are not going forward, hang on, that slide's disappeared, okay. Um, I think it probably dropped off the bottom of the screen, but um, so you can't see it, but it gives you um, AUG with the USTUS in parentheses here is what you expect to see. When the um, when a different star sheet runs across this um, with the intention of producing a diplomatic edition, the simple transcription that, um, that Charlotte showed you in uppercase on the left in her in her example, what you want to see there is just AUG. Um, and so that script goes through and it says expand. Aha, when I find an expand, I want you to run a slightly different set of scripts on it. When you when when I come across an ABBER, print the content of the ABBER, but in uppercase. And not just in uppercase, but in uppercase according to Latin rules, so that U becomes a V. When you come across an X, just omit the content entirely, because an X um, is not part of the diplomatic transcription and should be, and is not on the stone, so we don't want to see it here. And so the, the diplomatic star sheet turns this markup into exactly what we see up here at the top of the slide, AVG, um, written on the, um, on the uh, in the edition printed in the diplomatic edition um a second type of abbreviation that we come across is something like this where we have the the letters chor chai omicron rho on the stone and we know it's an abbreviation because it's not a full word but we haven't foggy as what it stands for, or we're not willing to commit to saying what it stands for in, in our edition. In that case, we only have one part rather than three parts to this abbreviation, and that is the abbreviation, the part that is on the stone. Okay, And so we tag it simply with the aber tag. And that means exactly the same as aber meant before. And when we run the same star sheet across it, it does the same thing. Okay, It goes through and it says, um, look for an expand, doesn't find one, look for an aber, print the contents of that aber. OK, um, possibly with um, some conventions such as having parentheses um, after it. Again, the that's dropped off the bottom of the screen. In other words, you'd be able to see what um, I'm showing you. And when it does a, a diplomatic transformation, it transforms the content of ABBER into uppercase um, core, as you see in the original version up here on the on the stone. 
Um, more complex abbreviations I won't go through in as much detail, but there's a slightly more going on here in that you have um, an abbreviation where not everything that's on the stone is part of the expanded text. You have this part, which is the AM, the abbreviation mark, which is in the abbreviation. It is in the bit on the stone, but it is not in the fully expanded word. And so we, we nest the transformation in this way. And the style sheet um, follows all the same rules as before, but when it finds, when the um, the editorial style sheet finds that am element, the edit, the abbreviation mark, um, it ignores the content. But when the diplomatic style sheet runs through that, um, it finds the am element and it does print its content. But as with the rest of the aber, it prints it in uppercase. So the um, the editorial style sheet would print Augusti Duo, the diplomatic trust style sheet would print AUGG with the double G as you'd, um, as you'd expect to see. Okay, and in fact, on this slide, it has, um, it has a period of one, there's the editorial and there's the diplomatic with the double G. Um, I apologize for, for the, the editorial and diplomatic views having disappeared from the previous two sets of slides. Um, and the only other example is one where there's a non-sequential abbreviation. So here we have an abbreviation that has um, two different parts um, to the, the X. The bits that need to go in parentheses are not connected to each other. So we actually have two different ABBA elements and two different X elements, which some people have in the past objected to and said, but there's not two different abbreviations. But if you remember that the ABBR element means the part of this word that is on the stone, um, it doesn't mean an abbreviation in its entirety, um, then you can see that the semantics are still correct. You've got which parts are on the stone, all the parts that are in ABBA, which parts are in parentheses, all the parts that are in X. Um, and the, the star sheet is exactly the same star sheet that I've described. We'll go through that and we'll produce consul with parentheses there, and we'll produce cost in uppercase for the diplomatic. Um, where you have a full word abbreviation, this is um, again fairly um, fairly straightforward. We um, we have uh, exactly the same as was going on with Augusti Duo, um, except that the entire abbreviation is an am. So in the editorial version, we don't see the L shaped symbol at all. Um, but in the diplomatic version, all we see is the L shaped symbol. Okay. Um, and this is this slide here is just a summary of, um, of what those four elements um, mean in, um, in abbreviations. But um, I will stop there um, rather than read that out and hand over to um, Charlotte. Thanks, Gabby. Let's have a very quick look at Lucina just to finish off. Uh, so you've met these already um, uh, in one sense. Um, so here we've got a, a stone where there is clearly um, there's clearly some damage. There are, are letters lost, and we as editors are attempting to restore them. So in this case, we're pretty sure that we we know what the next four letters will be uh, after the epsilon. In the second case, we know. Uh, what the letters will be after the sigma, but we're not sure what happens after that. Okay, so in both cases, we can res restore some of what's missing, uh, but not the second part. Okay, and we've got one unclear letter here. So uh, the first thing we need to do is mark the text that we're supplying as an editor uh, as supplied. Okay, so um, we, we do exactly what we saw in the example. We have supplied reason equals loss, and again, supplies reason equals loss. Um, we haven't yet dealt uh, with the letters that we don't know about. Um, we're going to uh, mark the sigma here as, uh, as unclear, um, as we've already seen uh, in the, the example text. So far, so good. Um, but we need to do something slightly different uh, with, with these characters here, because we, we don't know what they are, and we don't know um, we don't know the extent of them either, so uh, we're not restoring. Uh, we're not restoring those letters at all. Um, and in this case, we have to use something slightly different. So instead of supplied, we need to say that there's a gap. Okay, um, and again, we need to give that a reason. So we've got instead of supplied reason equals lost, we've got gap reason equals lost. Then we're giving it an extent, and in this case, an extent of unknown because we don't know uh, how much has been lost on the right-hand side here. 
And we need to quantify that. We need to say that we're talking about we don't know how many characters have been lost, okay, rather than however many lines have been lost, for instance. So in both cases, we've got some text that's supplied, followed by a gap, reason equals lost, with an unknown extent. Um, and we, we, we're saying that uh, the, the extent that we're, uh, the unknown that we're referring to is, is the number of characters, okay? Uh, so that just sums it up. Where we have text that we're restoring, we use supplied. And where we have, uh, where we don't know what that text will be, we have to say that there's a gap, reason equals lost. Um, now, we don't want this to transform for display as two separate things, okay? Um, we, we don't want this to transform with two sets of, uh, of square brackets. Uh, we actually want to remove those and transform them like this. Now, we still mark them up in the same way. So this is marked up as supplied. This is marked up as a gap. But in the style sheet that converts our XML to HTML for display on the web, for instance, um, we will actually tell it to remove uh, these brackets and treat the whole thing as one so that we end up with the correct display. Okay. Great. Um, so um, to, to, to summarize, to finish, I guess there's two things I want to, um, to say. One is just briefly that if you're doing this um, uh, following this session as part of a taught course, whether whether mine here in London or one of the others in the world that um, that is using this, there is a um, an exercise suggested at the bottom of the um, the session page, um, and this exercise is basically to to do what you've um, started doing um, so far with um, with Charlotte and. Um, uh, use the XML editor, um, whether Oxygen or your own XML editor, use the XML template that's downloadable from the Epidoc structure page, um, which we've also put a link to on the, um, the Synergosis session page for this um, uh, class, um, and find some texts um, of your uh, that, that you are interested in, um, and we've given some links on that page to a bunch of Greek inscriptions, Latin inscriptions, Greek papyri, and also um, I've linked you to um, both the Flickr Commons um, site for inscriptions, uh, search search results for inscriptions, and also a little zip archive that I made um, of English inscriptions which are damaged. So if you if you're not um, a Greek or Latin epigraphist and you'd rather do something in English. Um, uh, you can you can download that and have a go. And these are just some broken texts. And figure out how you would mark these up in Epidoc. Um, if you want to do this in some language other than English, um, that is that is a modern language in your own language, then feel free to, to search the web and find some images of that and, and mark these up. Um, just to try at least three texts. Um, if the texts are all very short and very easy, then then do a few more just to be on the safe side. If you've got some quite interesting complex texts, then three is probably enough. Um, and just just have a go at that. Um, so and and for for my students, bring them along next week, and we'll have a look at them. And if you if there were bits that you weren't sure how to deal with, that's absolutely fine. We'll we'll discuss that. I don't expect you to have become experts in the course of this um, this one hour and fifteen minutes of uh, of tuition um, yet. You will be experts by the end of next week's class, of course. Um, the other thing I wanted to just add is that um, if anybody has watched this um, and it is still um, in your um, in your time, uh, January or early February 2020, um, and you are very keen to learn more about Epidoc, um, so if you're watching this later than that, you know, several years in the future, um, greetings from the past, but um, you're too late for this particular. Um, opportunity, but there is um, at this link you'll find information about an event um, in London, um, that a week long event um, that Charlotte and I are both um, uh, teaching at, along with a couple of others, um, uh, which will give much more in depth and hands on um, guidance in the use of um, in the use of Epidoc and of the Epidoc publication tool FS that we've um, that we've talked about. Um, so um, feel free to drop, uh, you know, well information on that page on how to apply um, for that uh, for that school um, and there, there are various other epidoc training events that take place around the world if you if you can't be in london um, 
in early 2020, um, either because um, you're in a different part of the world or you're from the future, um, the, um, there will be other events that you can, um, that you can find uh, on that. Um, does anyone else want to add anything, questions or further comments? Mitko, yes. Uh, one or two things. Um, if I can. The, the first is that, uh, well, Charlotte has uh, that uh, be careful, make your documents uh, well formed. That when you have tag one and tag two opening uh, uh, tag and closing tag to an element, its daughter element should be opened and closed within it. So uh, you open tag one, you open tag two, you close tag two, and then you close tag one. But when you have an empty element, it could be anywhere because it won't intervene with the other elements. So elements like line break or gap, you can put them within, uh, which is uh, which makes them very comfortable. Uh, they simply mark breaks in between. Uh, so they could be nested anywhere in the in the schema. Then won't won't be any tag crossing, uh, which is uh, I think something worth noting. Uh, the other thing is that. Uh, mm, the the schema which uh, everything is validated uh, is uh, is applied from uh, a distance uh, so uh, there's a link to the epidoc server when the uh, the file is uh, uh, stored and uh, you need to have a good internet connection if you don't it uh, your oxygen could react a bit slowly but uh, uh, this uh, shouldn't uh, bother you and uh, uh, if the internet connection isn't good or is it uh, it happens in uh, epidoc workshops when a lot of people are uh, trying to connect to uh, the same server to validate. It could not display uh, all the mistakes right away, or it could not validate right away. But uh, uh, people probably should have in mind when they start encoding that if there's something wrong or if there's something clumsy with their editor, probably it's not their fault or their editor's fault. It might be due to the uh, overloaded uh, or poor internet connection. Yeah. Uh, you can download, of course, uh, the schema file locally, and you can yeah. put the local file. But I think this is not recommended. Uh, actually, at I, all because, I, I probably uh, would recommend that. Actually, real time. I probably would recommend yeah. that actually for most most people, unless um, unless you're, you're you're sure you're on a very very good internet connection, and you're lucky, and it's a day where the Stoa server, where the epidoc files are kept, um, is also having a good internet connection day. Um, it can it can quite often slow things down. Um, Charlotte, would you would you um, throw up that XML file again on your screen, please? Um, just want to show that just quickly. Um, so if you go to the top of that file where there is the link to the Epidoc schema, um, what you can do is you can copy that URL, pop that into your browser, and that will give you um, the Epidoc schema, which you can download. And if you put it in the same folder as your XML file that you're editing, um, ignore that this looks horrible. Um, but if you save that with exactly that file name, tei-epidoc.rng, you put it in the same folder as your XML file. And then as Charlotte is doing, you delete the rest of the URL from in your XML file. And you just keep the, the file name. And you do it twice, because just below you need to do the same thing for the, um, for the schematron. Um, validation, um, then when you validate, it will always be validating more quickly, um, even if both you and the star are having very good internet, fast internet connections at that, at that point. Um, so, so yeah, thank you, Mitko. That's a really good suggestion. Anyone else want to add or suggest anything? Um, there's been some discussion in the um, in the sidebar, um, in that is to say, in the um, the uh, live chat box on YouTube, um, with uh, Mohammed Amer, who is um, interested in a possible future session on um, inequalities in the digital capabilities in different countries and and how we deal with that. We've talked, one of the things, I mean, one of the things is, is not everywhere has the same access to reliable um, internet connections. Um, and so, you know, having a local copy of the schema might be one um, one possible solution to that. But obviously there's there's much more um, impact to that. There's, you know, some parts of the world 
with um, much less access to information technology generally. Um, some places in the world where YouTube is blocked, um, you know, all sorts of issues that um, that address this. And I think that that requires a whole session. I think that's not something that we can specifically address in a session on Epidoc, um, but it is something that I think we can. Um, I, I would be very interested in in hearing people discuss various approaches to that in a future Synergosis session. And, and uh, Midco, you and Monica and I might might have a chat about that for, for the summer, if that's something, um, in particular, a summer guide might be interested in um, in helping with that. There, you can, you can localize the product you're using, including... For example... Uh, uh, um, Yeah, I mean, another issue is that we we, we say oxygen, oxygen is not free, but it is cheap. Well, this is something that... Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. We're, we have slight time lag, I think. You're also now muted. Yeah. Go ahead. We can hear you now. Well, I did it. I did uh, I was able to on it, but uh, tax is in the uh, this is something probably within within the framework of this course, but it could be could be localized also, linguistically and as uh, other features also. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we often talk about um, how most of what we do, we try to use open source and free software for. Um, we, we use Oxygen because it is, um, it is a really good XML editor, and there is this 30-day free license uh, that you can use um, if you're just trying it out. And even if you, um, if you need the full license, um, that's, it's actually very cheap for this kind of software, and especially for the quality of software it is, only for $99 US dollars for a full um, license um, is, very, um, is very respectable. And so, you know, if, if you seriously needed that for some reason, that would be a, that would be a, a reasonable cost. Um, of course, there are parts of the world where $99 US dollars is a lot of money. Um, and so it's not it's not acceptable to to say to people, well, if you if you want to do XML, if you want to do Epidoc, you have to spend $99 on your on your um, software. Um, and so, you know, there are free XML editors out there. We haven't talked about them in particular, but they'd be easy to find. I mean, just Google free XML editor um, uh, and look for some reviews and recommendations of, of good ones. But um, but these are all things that we should be thinking about in terms of in terms of accessibility. Um, and there's other kinds of accessibility as well as um, as well as global inequalities. There's there's um, you know, there's, there's disability access to, to the software we use and, and all sorts of things. I think I think a lot of discussion about some of these issues, I think, would be really useful. Um, but as I say, this this session may not be the right place for that for that discussion. Um, OK, if no one else has any other specific points or questions about Epidoc, um, we might end this session here. We've we've overrun only by twenty minutes. That's not um, that's not bad. We 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 had worse um, recently. Um, I um, I will just uh, say next week um, we have a session um, with um, Paolo Granados Garcia and uh, Matteo Romanello, who are going to introduce. Um, the Python programming language, um, which will be a really exciting session, and um, I can almost guarantee you will find it easier than you currently expect you will. Um, uh, so it's not, not going to be in the least bit frightening. Um, so please do join us for that. And a week after that, we will have a follow-up session, uh, the second of two sessions on Epidoc, where we'll be introducing Epidoc publication mechanisms, including the FS, um, Epidoc Frontend Services tool, um, and that will be taught um, by um, Martina Filosa, and Simona Stoyanova, and I'll, um, I'll possibly contribute a bit to that um, as well. Um, so thank you all very much, um, people following live, also people watching um, asynchronously on, on YouTube. Um, um, cheers, see you next time. And thank you, Charlotte and Mitko. Thank you, bye.